Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us in today's policy paper presentation. My name is Marie, my pronouns are she and her, and I will be your facilitator in today's session as a member of the Karolinska branch of Decolonizing Global Health. I'm delighted to be here with you all today, uh, but I think it is important for me to acknowledge my position within the uh, Decolonizing Global Health movement. I was born in France, an extensive colonizer uh, from the 17th century until now. I would also like to acknowledge that I have benefited from white supremacy and the privileges granted to European citizens, uh, such as the opportunity to study a Master of Global Health at a prestigious academic institution, such as Karolinska Institute. Uh, so I would like to note that this event is recorded and will be available on YouTube in the next few days. And if you would like, you can follow us on Twitter for the duration of this event with the name at DGH Karolinska. And you can send us your questions through that channel or the chat function on Zoom. Now, we are gathered here today to discuss decolonizing global health, Karolinska's policy paper, which is seeking to address concerns on coloniality in education at higher um, education institutions. So I would now like to present today's agenda with firstly an introduction of the DGH movement and uh, DGH KI's policy paper, which will be presented by uh, DGH members Ahmed, Gillian and Emma. Uh, this will be followed by presentations from our external reviewers, Renzo Ginto, Laram Kumba, and Bayanta Midokpadio, who will share their perspectives on the policy paper. And lastly, there will be a discussion with Karolinska Institute's president, uh, Alder Peter Odesson, the president, um, uh, sorry, the department di uh, director of education at the Department of Global Public Health. Helen Molstad Alfeson and the head of teaching and learning, Jessica Valke. Now to Ahmad, Emma, and Gillian, who will present the DGH movement and the policy paper. The floor is yours. Can you see our uh, presentation? Okay. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Um, this part will be um, co-presented by Gillian and I, and we'd like to start with a little bit of history about decolonizing global health. Um, so at first, we're looking at these two pictures, and these two pictures uh, represent the start of decolonizing global health student-led movement in the last decade. On the right is the moment of victory of the hashtag roads must fall in South Africa that started as a movement to take down the statue of Cecil John Rhodes and call uh, for decolonization of education. This movement extended all the way to Oxford University as demonstrated by the picture on the left. But what does the call for decolonization really mean? And what is the value of a statue? Well, Displaying racist and white supremacy symbols is an active process. It's not passive at all. To state that white supremacy is a core and enshrined constitution of that institute, and by extension to that country. It reiterates that colonization and white supremacy are alive and doing pretty well. It will be preserved and nurtured um, to raise a new generation on hate and rub it on the face uh, rub it in the face of those who think they are free. They're no longer subjects or slaves, but that you've never really been free, that history will one day repeat itself and white supremacy will rise again. After all, you see it in statutes, in street names, in halls, in buildings, in scholarships, in awards, and names of institutions. That's why the hashtag roads must fall is not just about a statue, it's a movement for decolonization that goes beyond a piece of stone. So how did the roads must fall and decolonization of education influence decolonizing global health student-led movement? Well, 
Harvard have hosted a student-led decolonizing global health conference, which inspired Duke University, who had a team of ambitious students who really wanted to make a difference. And they hosted their own uh, student-led decolonizing global health conference. You can see in the picture, the core team uh, of uh, the Duke University. And they inspired in turn our sister groups, forming and organizing in other universities like Edinburgh, London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, Karolinska Institute, Johns Hopkins, and other global North universities. And here, I want to acknowledge that the movement, although started in a positive light and is hopeful, upon having a closer look at which universities are working on it, it's equally worrying and alarming. Why, you might wonder, will this unbalanced uptake by global North institutions while uh, seeing Global South students not organizing in a similar fashion and pace is alarming and is an extension and further evidence to the problem that we have. So what is this student-led decolonizing global health movement is calling for? And here I would like to um, uh, reference back to a, an article uh, or a paper published by um, uh, Ali uh, Murad Bouyoum and the uh, Duke University core team. And they point at three main points uh, that the movement is calling for. And here I will quote and summarize what do they state about each point. So first the paradigm shift. So it's to repoliticize global health by grounding it in a health justice framework a shift from the col colonialistic, imperialistic, capitalistic systems that are enshrined in racism, sexism, and equity and equality. Uh, this paradigm shift needs to happen at both individual and institutional levels, and we need to pay a lot of attention on the institutional uh, shift. Uh, second, leadership shift. And before I state what does it really mean, I would like to remind you of our discussion yesterday about really how there is a huge imbalance in who re leads the uh, global and public health um, um, uh, organizations and movement across the world. And we can see a clear divide um, with having the majority of the leaders being um, white old men. So that is something that we need to pay attention to. But what do they say when they talk about the leadership shift? So the global North needs to lean out on an individual, national, and institutional level to stop reproducing racist and colonialist ideologies. This should also consider gender, racial, and other characteristics should be fair and not fall into tokenism in the process. And finally, knowledge check. Currently, the status quo is knowledge is being produced in the global north and then transferred to the global south. But this knowledge check calls for that knowledge is not unidirectional, but instead reciprocal with contributions from Global South, driving discussions and practice, both locally and globally. Otherwise, and here I quote Laura, we will, are we just really pushing to prove our wokeness? So having said and given this introduction, now we would actually like to introduce ourselves. We hope to give you a brief understanding of the movement and then introduce ourselves in such a context that reflects our values and beliefs. So my name is Ahmed Abadi. I'm a second year master's public health epidemiology student at Karaska Institute. I am a male. I come from Jordan, a middle income country, and my background is medicine. Although I'm a person of color, I still want to acknowledge my privileges of being a male. I come from a middle class family, and I, am, uh, I have this opportunity to study at one of the top institutions in the world. And I give the floor to Gillian. Hello, I'm Jillian Murphy. Uh, I'm a first year master's in public health epidemiology student at KI. Uh, I'm originally from the US, which is a high income country, and I have a background in psychology and sociology. Although I am a woman, I am still white and I want to acknowledge my privilege of also coming from a middle class family and also having the opportunity to study here at Karolinska Institute. As a group, Decolonizing Global Health at KI, we are students coming from low, middle, and high income countries of different sexes and ethnicities, but all privileged to having studied at KI. 
Just to give some history of DGHKI, we were first contacted through the public health section as part of MF by Hampus Holmer, who wanted to mentor a student-led discussion on DGH for the global health students. Within one month and with support from Hampus, the Global Public Health Department at KI, the Edinburgh DGH Group, and all the speakers who contributed, we managed to organize the conference in May of last year. This pushed us as a group to continue our work and expand it. We applied to register DGH Sweden as a nonprofit organization, and we started a call for new members from all programs. We are happy to have managed to do some work considering COVID-19, and we've submitted a paper to a special issue on decolonizing global health to a third world thematics journal we have participated in discussions and conferences. We have organized a book club. We are here today to discuss the policy document and we work with other groups and committees. Our vision at DGHKI is to empower students worldwide to decolonize existing global health structures. And now on to the policy document. Although it is currently displayed as owned by DGHKI, we hope after this conference that this will change and that KI will officially endorse the paper after edits and amendments. The paper starts with an introduction to stress on the need and importance of DGH at large and at KI. After that is a list of some definitions, but what's important is what comes next. So first, the reason for the policy is to bring about a paradigm shift in global public health education, teaching, and practice through creating equal partnerships, promoting critical reflexivity, and challenging the status quo. Next, the policy statement. In bringing about change, this policy seeks to acknowledge the colonial roots that created the foundation of global public health, to challenge the educational institute about the disparities, inequities, misconduct and injustice the current status quo is creating in teaching, policies, culture, advocacy, and research. Next, to give voice to the vulnerable, the marginalized, and the partners that have been subjected to the prejudice of colonially, colonially driven power dynamics, and to create a Global North Institute that is a conscious, reflective, supportive, just, and fair enabler and an ally to the people, institutes, and partners from the global south in global public health, policies, educational disciplines, research, culture, and equitable opportunities, including, but not limited to, funding, exchanges, work, job opportunities, and authorships. The next part is we have three parts of the procedure and we will start with education. We want to participate in the reflection and reviewing of the curricula at KI and promote a conscious decolonized curricula. We want to promote pedagogy to be balanced and reflective to knowledge beyond the dominant epistemology. We want to encourage diversity in representation, perspective, and background. Next, awareness and mobilization. We want to develop and adjust KY educational activities such as workshops for the student and staff bodies on decoloniality. We want to engage in discussions to foster decolonial paradigm shifts in global public health. And we want to collaborate on developing resources to promote reflection about decolonization and coloniality in global public health. And last, we want to promote fair collaborative partnerships between high income country institutions and lower middle income country institutions. We want to support researchers and students in ensuring reflexivity and added value before embarking on research projects abroad. And we want to advance critical reflectiveness in global health research and practice within KI and abroad. As for responsibilities of DGHKI, we want to contribute to the consultative process on curricula and policy review and change. We want to organize the and lead student-led activities, participate and engage as students, student representatives in discussions and conferences, and be a critical body that reviews and reminds KI about their role in DGH. And finally, 
We intentionally left this section empty so that this document is co-created with KI and so that KI can have ownership over this document with DGHKI. We hope to hear that KI will review the current conduct of education, research and practice, and that a committee will be established with a specific deadline to have reviewed all conduct since creation of KI, look into admission criteria, recruitment criteria, any possible gender imbalances, and the number of authors from lower and middle income countries for projects conducted there. We hope that KI will become an advocate for change and walk the walk and talk the talk by prioritizing submission to journals that are more inclusive and considerate of DGH's demands. We hope that KI will demand all course leaders to look into how they have tackled decolonization in their topics. And we hope that KI will work toward making the vision and ambitions instead in this policy document become a reality. We hope through our discussions later with our esteemed panelists, we will get a chance to have a fruitful discussion, gain more insight and perspective, and get out of this meeting today with an agreement for future collaboration and commitment for change. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Ahmed and Jillian. It was a, a real pleasure to um, have you introduce the DGH movement. And we will now move on to the external reviewers who will be presenting their feedback on DGH's policy paper. So our first external reviewer is uh, Renzo Ginto. So Renzo Ginto is the chief planetary doctor of PH Lab, which is a global think and do tank for advancing the health of both people and the planet. Renzo is also a medical doctor with training from the University of the Philippines, Manila, and holds a PhD in public health from Harvard University. He is a member of several high level international groups and has served as consultant for various organizations, including World Health Organization, the World Bank, USAID, and the Philippines Department of Health. Renzo, it is a pleasure to have you back with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marie. And, and thanks to uh, the vibrant community of the Karolinska Institute that, uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, you know, it's great to be back. Uh, if you remember, uh, almost, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, almost a year ago, um, I had a privilege to give the keynote uh, in your first conference on uh, decolonizing global health. And I'm just so impressed uh, by the, uh, the momentum uh, that, and, and the progress that uh, the decolonizing global health Karolinska uh, group has, has really um, you know, uh, sustained and driven uh, within the Institute. And now you are actually uh, presenting uh, a policy paper. So, so that uh, is, is quite admirable. Um, you know, first, I, I would like to acknowledge, uh, you know, what uh, Marie and Ahmad and Jillian uh, did when they were starting their, their remarks. You know, they acknowledge their, their backgrounds and privileges. And, and thanks, Marie, for actually uh, telling a bit about, uh, you know, my, uh, my background, which I'm supposed to also acknowledge. And, you know, I remember, um, you know, and I'm not sure if the doctors in Sweden uh, are already doing this, you know, when before you give a presentation, you, your first slide is usually about potential conflicts of interest. You know, you actually acknowledge that, you know, I'm not receiving money from pharma, that I am a consultant for the WHO. And I think that the future of global health will somehow have something like that, that everyone before they enter the, the room, before they participate in the table, uh, in the discussion table, they actually put on the table and acknowledge, you know, all their privileges. You know, I am from the Philippines, for instance, uh, but I also uh, had the privilege of studying in a global north institution. And so I think, you know, this uh, level of reflexivity is, is quite, uh, you know, uh, important. And I think that will be the future of global health discourse. Everyone, you know, putting on the table, you know, what, uh, you know, our backgrounds and privileges. I really love this effort. I think uh, this is a living document, I suppose. This is, you know, um, you know uh, you're still going to enrich it as the months go by, as you get more inputs from the rest of the Karolinska community. I think perhaps you're one of the first schools or institutions uh, or of higher learning and research uh, in the world that has something like this, you know, this kind of document. Uh, over the past several months, we've seen schools of public health, let's say in the US, uh, making statements against structural racism. But this one is really, you know, something broader. You know, you're saying that, 
you know, you're going to change the way you do research, you do your, your education, and, and that's quite uh, admirable. I appreciate that uh, the leadership of KI is actually in the room, or in the Zoom rather, especially uh, Ole Peter, who I had the privilege to actually work uh, with in the in a Lancet Commission on Global Governance for Health, which is very much related to uh, our work in decolonizing global health. Uh, and I understand that you know this paper was started by global health students, but my challenge to you, and tell me if you're already doing it, how about the other units of the Karolinska, you know, the biomedical arm, you know, the, the ones doing clinical research? Because what we want to make sure is that it's not only the global health you know, uh, students and faculty that are really embracing the decolonizing, uh, you know, um, movement or, or message. You know, it's really pan-KI, you know, all the different units, even those doing, you know, laboratory work should be part of this, uh, you know, journey, this movement. Um, you know, some comments, you know, I like, um, you know, the, the way you, you framed uh, education, uh, the changes that need to happen in the educational realm. It ranges from the institutional all the way to, you, you call it social, I would call it uh, interpersonal, you know, how you deal with each other within the uh, academic uh, institution. You mentioned engagement and you want to be engaged in the discussions around decolonizing global health. I want to uh, challenge you more. You don't want just to get engaged in the discussions. You should actually aim to make space and to amplify voices, especially those that are usually unheard. You know, because what we don't want to happen is that the future discussions about decolonizing global health has the Karolinskas and the Harvards and the London schools of the world, and we did not make space for, let's say, the universities in, you know, Africa, Latin America, and Asia. So how can KI be an agent for creating those spaces, you know, for others? Regarding research, you know, you mentioned meaningful and respectful partnerships. You included reflexivity. I also challenge KI, being one of the leading research institutes in the world, to challenge its own epi epistemological position, right? So that means we need, you know, we need to start interrogating our research methods, our assumptions. So it's not just about the conduct of research and the forging of research collaborations. I think that's step one, but we should interrogate the act or the conduct of research itself. Um, and, and I think that boils down to one comment that I wrote here. You know, we need to go beyond the cosmetic. It cannot be a mere checklist. Uh, and, 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 and of course, checklist is quite, uh, you know, easy, but it, and it's a first, usually it's a first step. But I think there's a much longer, you know, journey here that is deeper and, and more meaningful. Um, I think the colonizing global health is, is not just about, you know, changing the world order, right? You know, we tend to think about, you know, the global affairs. The colonizing global health is local too. And so my question to you is how is Karolinska and, and the community uh, is also aiming to address existing inequalities, for instance, within the country of Sweden, within Stockholm, within Karolinska, especially, you know, the, you know, the indigenous and the ethnic communities, the immigrant communities, for instance, um, in, 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 in Sweden. And I know a lot of international students uh, are part of this, this uh, movement. Um, this paper is a Karolinska Institute perspective, right? My question now is, how can we make sure that the policy paper has inputs from your partners in Ethiopia, in Uganda, in Thailand, right? And so I think that's the next step because we want this paper to be really enriched, not just from your perspective, but from the perspective of partners and collaborators. And if you notice, I didn't use the word beneficiaries. I didn't use the term uh, recipients because that is in itself, you know, colonial language. You know, finally, I know I have very limited time, you know, some additional points, you know, you mentioned, you know, what I'm sensing is that there's a really growing and, and exciting social movement within Karolinska. And the challenge now is how about the top leadership? And I know Ole Peter is going to respond to that, right? I think it takes two to tango, the students and the faculty rallying around this, but there needs to be some bold actions and decisions from the level of the Karolinska's uh, leadership, you know, including uh, President Otterson. My question also is how can Karolinska, because I know this is an internal document, you know, it's about what you're going to do within the Institute. But Karolinska is not just a Swedish institution. 
it's a global institution. And so I think you have a much bigger responsibility. And I would love to see Karolinska leading the elite league of global health research institutes to really decolonize, right? You're, you know, and then you need to identify, right? Like, you know, uh, you know, you're in the same league as the London schools and the Harvards of the world, right? You should actually come together. And, and I think there's, there's power in number rather than individual universities doing their own little actions. I think Karolinska, as the face of global health of Sweden, should also start examining its role in Swedish global health policy and diplomacy. And also, you know, you can lead the conversations around the role of Sweden as a country in global health to make sure that Sweden in general, and Karolinska in particular, does not contribute to the reproduction of the imbalances and the power asymmetries that you just mentioned. I would like to close my remarks by saying, Karolinska Institute that, you know, you, I think it was um, a Jillian, you know, that described that, you know, this, that described KI as a global North Institute that maybe in the future will be more ethical, responsible, you know, a decolonized global North institution. I think a much bigger vision is that Karolinska becomes a truly global institute owned by, inclusive of, and genuinely committed to all peoples of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for your insightful feedback. Um, insightful feedback, Renza. We really appreciate your suggestions to really take this paper to the next level, um, which is what we need to do. And uh, now I would like to welcome our next external reviewer, who is uh, Lara Mkumba. Uh, Lara Mkumba is a native of uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, by way of Atlanta, Georgia. She received her Master of Science in Global Health from Duke University, where she co-founded the Duke Decolonizing Global Health Working Group in 2018. She has spent the last decade working in international and domestic HIV AIDS research, as well as mental health, health equity, adolescent health, and sexual and reproductive health of sexual and gender minorities. Lara, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm I also would like to start off by recognizing my positionality um, that, you know, while I am a black African woman, I do also recognize that I do have privilege through my class and my level of education. And so given that also that that is going to be the perspective that is how I move through the world, but that is also oftentimes how I, my opinions or my um, language is informed by. Um, I would also like to say that uh, Renzo hit a lot of the points that I also had um, when I was pre-reading the document and also listening to your presentation. Um, I almost put in the chat, well, you didn't even need to have me here. Renzo's got it. But um, <laughs> um, but just to kind of reiterate um, again of some of the points that Renzo uh, pointed and one thing that I wrote down um, was, you know, it's, it's, well, first of all, I'd like to commend you. This is a very, very good document and it's really good to see um, that you are, um, one, that this is an initiative that's happening within your institution, but that you're also very transparent and public about it. Um, and that is something that is really admirable. And I recognize the hard work that went into creating this document. And it's also really, um, hope filling or it's it's really nice to see that you have the president of the institution sitting in this room as we're having this discussion um, and that is as Renzo said something that's really important with having the leadership of these institutions sitting in the room um, and that's very very important um, so going back to you know a similar point that I had with Renzo is um, something that I saw was it's really good that you're emphasizing how Karolinska will be interacting internationally with Global South partners. Um, but a question that I also had was I would like to see that there's um, emphasis also being put of thinking of those power dynamics that are happening within the institution. Um, and as Renzo said, how are you interacting with the indigenous populations? How are you interacting with whether it's students or with faculty or people that work with you or that you're in partnership with and community with who 
are, their positionality is not as privileged. Um, and they might have different intersections of marginalization and recognizing that, you know, colonialism wasn't just about, um, you know, European countries taking over these other countries around the world in Latin America, South America, Africa, and Asia, but it also has infiltrated to the point that within these countries themselves that these colonial ideologies have persisted. And so what does that look like then for Karolinska to, when as they're addressing their, how they relate to their international partners, especially partners who were formerly colonized, what does that look like for within the institution and how are they gonna, you know, if I was to come to Karolinska and um, by magic, I have a faculty position. What, how is that, that de, you know, anti-colonial perspective, how would that impact how I am interacting with my fellow faculty or people that I'm in the institution with? So again, really just thinking of those power dynamics within the institution. Um, another point was, uh, it's really ad, um, good and impressive to see that you want to improve representation within the institution. Um, and I'm I, I apologize, I can't remember who said it, but there was a point made about tokenism um, in the opening presentation. And I really want to harp on that point that representation should not just be about tokenism, that it shouldn't just be this checklist of saying, look, we have this diverse group. Um, it should really be inclusive in that you are actually including their perspective and their perspectives and their ideas that they are valued at the same level as their especially white male counterparts. So really want to, as you are working on this representation, really thinking of how do we go beyond just tokenism and this, as Renzo said, cosmetic changes and really drilling down to the root of the issue. Which brings me to one of the, the third point that I had was, um, I think it's, it's in there, but I would like to see more of this justice focus within this policy with some of these suggestions. Um, you know, it's, I think it's, it's, you know, it's very equity focused, which is really good. It's a really good start, but I want to push you to go to definitely a justice focus where justice is saying, I'm going to, we're going to address the, the reason why we don't have representations in our institution. The reason why, um, we have had such unequal partnerships or harmful partnerships with people in the global south and of course that's what decolonization is but what does that mean in a practical perspective what does that mean for karolinska to really have that justice focus um, and along those lines really again that restorative and reparative justice recognizing that there has been harm done in the past. How do you create space for people who have been harmed by Karolinska's um, actions? And this is not to say just strictly Karolinska, for all global health institutions in the global north, we all have to answer for the harm that we have done by perpetuating colonialist and white supremacist ideologies. So what does that look like to say that we are going to, one, we're working to address power dynamics going forward, but how do we also address the harm that's been done in the past. And I don't have an answer for that because I, I obviously I'm not within your institution, but I think as you're in conversations with leadership, really thinking of what would that look like to have that, you know, reparative justice and repairing those um, relationships and that could include reparations, um, being very clear that Karolinska did not get to the point that it is to being this leader in global health without some harm and honestly some exploitation happening at the, from the hands of other people. So what would that look like to really be accountable to those communities? Um, again, just want to end it all. It is really um, impressive to have this document and I recognize that it is a living document. And I also am very grateful for having the opportunity to review it and also have my input. And um, also saying, you know, as Renzo mentioned as well, um, having this collaboration with other institutions um, and also just emphasizing the importance of sharing this document with your existing Global South partners or partners who are in former colonized countries and what would they like to see? Because um, sometimes I think it's very easy for us to sit in our Global North institutions and definitely we can find our faults, but it's really different when the person that you have harmed actually sits and tells you, well, actually you should, I think you should be doing this. Um, and having that input where, and having that really good balance of recognizing the work that you need to do, but also 
recognizing the work that they tell you you need to do and what would that look like. Um, but again, ending it with this is a very, very good document, very excellent. Um, it's really impressive and it's actually, it's inspiring me to think of what would it look like for us to also have a similar, you know, going forward. What would that look like for us to have this similar, um, taking this action and writing it down and engaging with leadership? Um, so yeah, thank you once again for having me. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we really appreciated your um, your inputs, particularly your suggestions to include a, a justice focus in our mission to decolonize global health at Karolinska. And, and now we will move on to our final external review of presentation uh, from Bajenta Mikopadiayo. Uh, Bajenta Mukopadiayo is an alumni representative on the Decolonizing Global Health Coordinating Committee at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He also serves on Médecins Sans Frontières Canada Association's Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Working Group. Bajenta is a coordinator of the Canadian chapter of the People's Health Movement, working on PHM's campaigns around extractivism, privatization, and health aid. He works as a family doctor, uh, primar primarily in um, Cree territories of James Bay, Northern Canada, but also provides services to people who are unhoused or undocumented, as well as queer and trans youth in so-called Montreal. Bajalienta, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much to all of you for having me here. Um, I, I really appreciate this process. I really think it's quite inspiring. And again, as uh, Laura was saying, it makes me think of things we can do as well. Um, and I'd also like to start with acknowledging my positionality. As you've already heard, I am a physician. I'm a settler on Indigenous territories in what is called Canada. Um, I have immense amounts of class um, uh, privilege, and on the global scale, I do have the privilege of Canadian citizenship. Um, some of the um, some of the points, of course, Renzo and Laura have already discussed at uh, quite great length, and you know, I, I really endorse some of what they've said. Um, I took a little bit of feedback from my colleagues at the Decolonizing Global Health Coordinating Committee at the London School. Um, just to see uh, if there was additional points that we might want to bring. And there's three main things that I think um, maybe haven't been covered. And so in the interest of time, I'll just add them. Two of them are perhaps more details and more semantics oriented. And there's one larger structural piece that I think would be an interesting discussion to have. Um, so the first two very fairly quick points is one is in the definitions. I think, you know, we've all talked about so far in this conversation about words like equity and justice. But I do think having uh, clear definitions of what those mean, just so everybody's on the same page when you discuss them, um, would probably be very help helpful in, in the document, because I can use that word from my perspective. Again, talking about positionality, it means one thing to me, but it might mean something else to someone else. And so to be, um, when, when you're using those words to make sure everybody's more or less on the same page, or even if they're not on the same page, they understand what you mean when you say that. I think that's actually pretty important to do. And um, so that would be one thing in, I would suggest in the definitions part, but to kind of explore what those words mean. Um, and I think one of the key things to talk about is, um, and I think this is a, uh, an issue just at large um, when we're talking about uh, equity uh, in global health is to tease out the difference between what equity means, uh, justice means, and what diversity means. I think, uh, people get, people tend to lump all of that into one thing, and we're actually talking about very different things. And I think it's important to separate those out and say what those are and be explicit about it. Um, the second uh, thing that, uh, you know, I thought of, and a few of uh, my colleagues at the DGH group at the London School thought about is um, when we're talking about diversity when it comes to decision making structures, is whether, you know, it, it, the language you've used uh, in, the, in the policy paper is to encourage diversity. And I really think you should be bold and like ask for more and ask for things um, uh, that you are right and just say to ensure it. There's a difference between encouraging and ensuring it. Um, encouraging, it's hard to measure if someone's encouraged or not. It is easy to measure if somebody's insured it or not. And I think having those measurable, very specific um, targets is really important. And I think you have every right as a decolonizing global health group 
um, as students at your institution to us that of your institution, that, that it be measurable that what it does. And I think um, it also helps uh, address some of the questions about voice. Um, who is able to speak up for what reasons, you know? And I think, I think people here are probably generally aware that even if you encourage uh, many people, there are structural barriers for them to actually participate. And so encouraging is not enough. You can invite all you want, but there are often large, large gaps that have to be addressed before people can actually be a part of something. And so I, I would ask you to, to push beyond just encouraging and to talk about ensuring it. And what that means is actually a little bit different. It helps first uh, measure it a bit better, and it actually probably forces the institution to change more. Um, and the final thing that I think that we would like to talk about, and um, we haven't quite discussed, and this is probably a much more interesting conversation now that the leadership's in the room, is that if you are going to do the decolonizing work, um, there's two things that you have to, have to, have to have on the table, and that is who's making the decisions and where are the resources coming from. Um, it's very important that if you're talking about bringing in partners from all over the world or even within the institutions, that if, if the students are driving um, this process within the school, what's their decision-making power? Is it just a consultative process that you just get to say your opinion and then it's not really taken into account that you don't get to transform the institution? Or do you actually get a shape in saying what's going to happen? Um, do you get a say in doing that? And I think who's making the decisions is a critical thing to uh, sort out in, in this conversation around decolonization, decolonization, both externally and within the institution, and then resources. This decolonizing a curriculum, decolonizing um, research partnerships, decolonizing financial arrangements, that takes time, it takes staff, it takes, um, you know, you can ask people to do it as a volunteer thing off the side of their desk, but it'll never get done that way. It needs dedicated time, it needs dedicated resources, including financial resources, and talking about what that looks like, you know, it can be time limited. Like you, you have to say, okay, over the next three years, we're gonna dedicate this much time to do this, um, but it has to be done. You can, like a lot of this work is volunteer. Uh, a lot of us do it on a volunteer basis, but it's not sustainable in the long term. And it isn't going to be, um, I don't think that it's actually going to have a long lasting change unless the institution is putting resources and time behind it. And, and that discussion is always a little bit delicate and you may not want to put it in the policy paper right away, but it is a discussion that needs to be, has to happen and eventually it needs to be written down and someone needs to sign off on it. So that's our feedback. Thanks once more for having us here. Thank you, Bajedenta. Um, thank you for your feedback and um, suggestions to um, really take our policy paper to the next level. I particularly liked your um, suggestion to include measurable targets in our policy. Um, I think that would add a lot of value and um, yeah, thank you so much to all of our external reviewers for participating um, and giving us feedback. We will now take a quick two minute break to just get some coffee, uh, maybe stand up and have a breather. Uh, so we will be back at uh, 15 uh, 48 for those in uh, Central European time zone. And then we will move on to the discussion with members of care faculty. See you very soon.
So welcome back everyone. Um, sorry we had to make this break quite short. Um, I hope you were able to set up and get a little bit of air. We'll now move on to uh, the discussion members of care faculty and it will be moderated by Jillian and Ahmad. The floor is yours. Hello. Uh, thank you, Marie, so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce myself. So it will be me, Emma, and uh, Ahmad who will be co-moderating this session. And uh, in, in my introduction, I also wish to address some of the privileges that I carry with me. Uh, so as I said, my name is Emma, and uh, like Ahmad, uh, am I a second? Uh, uh, second year student at the Master of Public Health Epidemiology program. I come from Finland, that is a high income country. And uh, while I am a woman, just like Gillian, the society that I come from is fundamentally matriarchal and one where women enjoy a high level of respect. Hence, have I enjoyed the privilege of equal opportunity from birth. I have had the privilege to access world class education from a young age. And next month, Am I graduating with a third university degree with very, very little debt? Because as the EU citizen, I am exempted from tuition fees. I very much believe that I am where I am today because of structural inequalities, which promotes people like me. And I have many times asked myself who I am to engage in the DGH discussion. And the answer that I have reached is, who am I not to stand up for what I fundamentally believe to be just equality and justice? So with that being said, I would like to shift the attention to Karolinska Instituta. KI has a strong name internationally and has established some very strong international partnerships. And the notable, notable partnership in this discussion is the KI and Universia Macarera partnership. We can also see increased cooperation and authorship from LMICs in LMIC related research. Decolonizing global health has been introduced in some courses and at the Department of Global Public Health. And KI takes concerns regarding racism, sexism, and harassment very seriously. Further, has KI been very forthcoming in having open discussions with students on sensitive topics, of which the discussion we are here to have today is an example. KI has appointed a committee and is currently reviewing the naming of statues and buildings on campus property in regards to concerns about the, the use of the name Retsis. KI is also engaged in continuously reviewing curricula and is open to the opinion of students. Lastly, and importantly, I would like to point out that KI is interested in decolonizing global health and has the willingness and openness to have a discussion about making appropriate changes. So having acknowledged what KI has done organically and through several initiatives in the process of DGH, I want to say that we are not here to celebrate these achievements today. We are here to acknowledge that although work has been done, we're still far from the ideal scenario that DGH promotes. Thus, this is the standard that we will hold KI accountable to achieve. As a leading institution in health, research and education, we have been taught by some of the best academics to be pioneers, to challenge ourselves to conduct the research and to strive for the best implementation of work. Therefore, we will do the same with GAI as our institution and compare the current status quo only with the ideal vision of decolonization of global health, not with the lacking past or present performances of other countries or universities. After all, the past can't change. So it's up to us living in the present to make a difference that in the future, people will be able to say, finally, someone did something about this injustice. Because otherwise, the future will judge the same way that the present is now judging the past. So with this opening statement, I would like to welcome to the discussion very courageous and inspiring leaders in global health and at KI. What makes them special is that they are willing to join today and be critical of the work of the institution. Yet be proud that they believe in changing the paradigm and making a better institution. 
we know it might not be comfortable to talk about decolonizing global health, but you are making the right decision and step in doing so. Um, so I first would like to welcome um, Ola Peter Ottesen. Uh, Ottesen took office as the president of Kalinska Institute on August 1st, 2017, after having served eight years as the president of University of Oslo. Uh, his physician and scientist by training. Uh, since 2019, Ottesen has been a member of the Lancet Site Commission on Peaceful Societies through Health and Gender Equality. Also, we would like to uh, welcome Hella Molsted uh, Olvisen. Hella is a medical anthropologist with a doctoral degree in global health as the Departmental Director of Education, Department of Global Public Health at Kinesiska Institute. She is promoting interdisciplinary and cultural thinking in the master programs. Um, her research focuses on how people define, experience and cope with health concerns and how uh, people respond to uh, public programs that promote improved human development. And we will have with us also Jennifer Bolke. Um, she's an educational developer for the unit of teaching and learning at Karinska Institute. Um, her role includes teaching, training, and advising on issues related to sustainable education, international education, intercultural education, and content and language integrated learning. Um, she has a re uh, she's recent papers uh, that call for the partnership uh, approach with students um, and a global citizenship um, uh, education to be integrated in continuous professional uh, development of uh, teaching staff. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Um, I will stop the sharing, but at first, before we um, give you the floor, we just highlight that we will take questions from the audience. So uh, please write down in the chat uh, box. We, we've seen that some of you have already written some questions, but please take the opportunity to write your questions because we will take them by the end of the conversation. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Uh, really a pleasure to have you. So at first, we'd like to open up with a general question. And um, we will ask it to all of you, but we will start with Ole. So can you please give us your opinion on the policy document? Yes, I would be happy to do so. <clears throat> the first thing I would like to say is that it's excellent that uh, you take this initiative because uh, your voices need to be heard. And uh, my, I would say, strong feeling about this is that uh, a university cannot really move ahead without the kind of thinking and the kind of energy that you provide to this particular question. So um, I think it's absolutely excellent that uh, you have this uh, engagement in uh, global health and in decolonizing global health. Absolutely. Uh, I see in all the universities that um, the students are taking the scene to a much larger extent than at KI. In fact, I'm disappointed at KI when it comes to the engagement of students. So you are a fantastic exception to the rule. I should hope that all students would engage in the same way that you do. Um, when this is said, I would also add that um, there is one very, very important aspect that I would like to bring to the table. Uh, Emma went into what I think is uh, the important thing here. And that is not only to discuss this at, um, you know, at an abstract level, but to latch onto the processes that are going on. Emma brought to the table some of these processes. The uh, collaboration that we have with Makerere is one example. This is a flagship collaboration on the part of KI now, where we embed the different aspects that you bring up in your policy document. In fact, the partnership now with Makerere is supposed to be an operationalization of what we're discussing here, how to act on the global scene, how to foster international collaborations that leave no trace, if at all possible, of our colonial past. I think it's essential, and this is a message to all of you, that you latch onto what is going on at KI 
that's the way to proceed because now we have done an ex excellent job in handling this as a very overarching level. But you know, this is not sufficient. You have to enter the scene and be co-creative with the KR leadership when it comes to actual projects. If you don't do that, this will lead to nowhere. And we need your energy. We need your perspectives in what we are doing as concrete projects. That's a strong message to you. Also, I would like to say that uh, it's a strong message also because if you don't latch on to the, the positive projects that are going on, well, what you are doing could easily be misconceived as a portrait of a glass that is just empty or half empty. In fact, the glass, even though it might be not half full, the glass is not empty. We are making progress. And unless you also take this into account in your internal discussions, there is a risk that we might end up in a sort of polarized future where your energy will not be put to the best of use for KI. This is my strong message to you. We need you not only as authors of a policy paper, we need you in concrete projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ole. Um, indeed, that's why we wanted to start actually our um, introduction for the moderation of the uh, panel with the first acknowledging and recognizing what KA has done. But then we wanted to strive to see the future, how we can build up on what KA has built so far and improve to reach the ideal vision that we hope that we together can we, uh, we work on. Um, we also- uh, I could just like add that I just, uh put in the chat uh, uh, references to three papers that we just submitted on this very issue, two in Nature Medicine and uh, one in EMJ, British Medical Journal, that have to do with inequities, power asymmetries, all the different issues that we are discussing now. And uh, for future papers, we would certainly like to have you as participants and co-creators. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, we'd like to ask Helle about uh, your opinion on the policy document, if you'd like to share with us. Yes, so thank you so much, Ahmad. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I am very excited to uh, be listening in on your movement and learning uh, on some of the values that you want to promote and that you really uh, express very nicely. So I feel as a very, um, um, I feel very happy to be invited. So uh, I agree that the engagement is really essential. Uh, and you know, we consider that education is very important for empowerment. And I think this movement is maybe showing that at least that part is working for a part of the students, that you really take on some of the things that you bring into KI and you also now take some of the pieces and really put them into this policy paper or this kind of process paper at least. So um, uh, I think one of the issues that, uh, that I struggled a little bit with in the paper is that the focus is very wide. So, you know, you know, from my qualitative methodology courses that I'm always very strict on, you know, having been to be clear about what are we talking about? Are we talking about the same things? Uh, and here, I think you launch some concepts that are very wide and quite elastic, at least for people who have not read in your reference list. Uh, so, so I find it a little bit difficult to find the focus in the paper. While I really uh, think there is work to do on all of them, I think it's a big mouthful. Uh, so I would like to, I mean, I completely agree with Ole Petter in saying that, you know, maybe there should be some, you know, sorting of what could be more important in order to create a, you know, a positive circle, building on what is already happening and maybe adding some additional ones that are not happening as of yet at KI to make it more concrete and to make sure that when I, for example, would bring this up in my in faculty meetings that I'm actually able to communicate what is it then? Because of course, decolonization is, 
is a very difficult word that you also described to, to explain to people. And that would go throughout. And I, I salute one of the reviewers who said, so what's going on outside of the global public health community? So what is going on outside of, the, um, uh, of, uh, of our department? Uh, and there, I think, to be more specific about what are, what are the main concerns and where is it you want to really build becomes very important. Then I really appreciate it that you uh, present this as a process. So I would assume that decolonization, it's not a fact or it has, doesn't have a date. It doesn't have a time point. It's really a process that needs to follow uh, throughout uh, the coming period. Uh, so I would just really support you in that, uh, that we need to really think uh, uh, along timelines. Um, I really appreciate that you put in some of the words of critical thinking. So we, at least at GPH, we find, we hope that we uh, provide you with tools for critical thinking. So we can give you cases to be inspired by, but then of course, what you do here is to take it another step and show how you can reflect on the questions themselves and on how actually to, to carry it forward. So there are some very, um, very good uh, words in the document already now on reflexivity and, and critical thinking. And my recommendation would be to simply uh, clarify them a little bit and you know, make them concrete uh, into some of the, the different activities that you would want to, to prioritize. I think that's all I would say uh, for now. Thank you so much, Shalda. Um, it's a very important points that you just raised. And I think um, we really do hope as, as a group that we can set uh, short, mid and long-term goals mm -hmm. that can be achieved. However, we also believe that this needs to be co-created with KI as an institution. And that's why we really, we are also interested in how we really can get involved in such projects in the, um, to engage students in this discussion and to be in, invited to these uh, collaborations. So I think this, what Ole and you have raised is something we really uh, look forward to, to have. And um, also would like to ask the same question to Jennifer now uh, about the opinion on the policy document. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I share um, my colleagues' enthusiasm and I'm extremely happy to be here and very proud to be part of this, uh, uh, of this, these types of discussions. I think it's high time that in our institution we have these kinds of more challenging conversations about you know, it can range from the nature of the knowledge that uh, uh, we share in our classrooms to the nature of relations to the way we see, we do, and, and, and we think the world. And I, I very much welcome these types of um, conversations. So thank you um, to all the students for, for your hard work. I, um, I agree with uh, Ule Peter that the student voice is missing. Um, the student voice is missing. I, this is the third university in which I work, and I've had um, very different ways of, of, of seeing how different institutions engage with students. And I really welcome a partnership approach to, um, to education. So for those of you who may not know what the unit for teaching and learning does, it's a, it's a unit where we design, create training for all uh, staff involved in uh, teaching, uh, but we also interact with students uh, and we also work with the support services because we've talked a lot today about the students and the teachers and I think the support services are just as, as uh, key players in creating an open, equitable and inclusive campus uh, as, as any uh, of us uh, are. I just maybe want to challenge Ule Petter a little bit here because um, I can't remember which one of the speakers mentioned this earlier, but uh, they, they said that it was important or they stressed the importance that we need to make space for those, make space for those voices that are traditionally unheard. If the student voice is traditionally unheard at KI, it is also our responsibility to create space for such interactions to happen. And, you know, students, 
know you know our institution from the student perspective but we know also in touch internal functionings we also know all the discussions that are going on in our campuses regarding the strategy which you see behind me ki strategy 2030 which if you think about it provides us a very unique platform actually to include many different things because we talked about a paradigm shift and if we are, you know, the paradigm shift, it's something that we've been talking about with regards to education specifically for years. Um, you know, I think that we've had, we, we've had so many uh, uh, rapid transformations over the past years to digitalization. It shows us that we are capable of engaging with change and engaging with change quickly and with quality. And I think the, the types of changes that you're calling for are equally as urgent, knowing the, 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 the social movements that are sweeping the globe right now, the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, um, you know, the um, uh, Fridays for Future movement, these are all youth led. Uh, and so I think that we can, we can be better at creating spaces for our students to, to come. And I welcome your suggestion of engaging with us on the curriculum, the, the curriculum meaning, you know, the, the, the teaching and learning arrangements of our courses, the examinations and assessment, the uh, intended learning outcomes of courses, the content of what we teach, but then everything else outside of that, whoever students get to interact with on our campus. So um, I think that it, of course, if you, it, it, you know, if we create such platforms, you also will know where, you know, you can concentrate your efforts and, and, you know, have a plan with kind of short term, medium term and longer term aims. And as you said, because this is, this is a, a paradigm shift, takes time. Uh, and, uh, and I think we can, uh, as Ole Petter also mentioned, latch on to, to different things uh, uh, to support your initiative. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for your input. And indeed, um, we actually would like to just state that we tried to invite um, MF to, to be part of the panel, but sadly we did not receive any uh, reply from them to, to represent a different perspective of the student voice, uh, especially the um, maybe the, the national student voice at the same time. But um, I think it's, it's what you just said, having the space, building from it is very important. And uh, we thank you so much for the input. And um, I give the floor also to Emma. Thank you, Ahmad. Uh, the next question I would also like to address to all of you. Um, and this one is, uh, is related to what uh, Jennifer was talking about, uh, the youth-led and student movements. We often see these activist uh, movements uh, maybe inducing in initial change by engaging with higher level stakeholders and advocating for legal and policy changes and so on. But uh, many of these movements, however, then die out because systemic changes become performative rather than uh, transformative in nature. And uh, an example of this could be a higher education institution that has a transformation committee that ticks the transformation box, but there is no real systemic changes that, that can be enacted by this committee due to resistance in the larger system. So my question here would be, uh, maybe Jennifer, if you would like to, to start answering this question in all of your opinion, uh, and assuming that KI endorsed this policy document, how can DGH remain a transformative organization within the larger KI system? Okay, that's a hugely, fantastically complex question. Um, I don't know if I really have an, an answer for you. I, I would say that, you know, of course, we've talked about the fact that change takes time. Um, but change is, is, is you know, if, if you want to step beyond the tokenism or, you know, the cosmetic aspect of policies, uh, you have to throw money at it, that's for sure. But it also has to, uh, you know, come from all sides of the university. So, you know, there are a lot of teacher-led initiatives uh, uh, or teachers who are, um, 
you know, working on decolonizing their courses as we speak at, at Karolinska. Maybe they don't call it like that. But, you know, uh, there are a lot of our teachers who look at their classrooms and have seen a huge demographic shift over the past, let's say, 10 years or so, uh, which has caused them to, to adapt their teaching. Um, and so I think that, you know, from my perspective, from, from the education, I think it, it's one way to um, transform practices is to engage everyone. And to engage everyone over time, you need incentives. Uh, you need also motivated people. Uh, so in, in my mind, you know, it's about um, finding who these champions are and how can, can we, you know, uh, whether these are our teachers, whether these are students, whether these are uh, support service staff, where are our champions and how can we further empower them to, to create this transformation that actually the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals asks for is absolutely transformative and our strategy aligns with it. So that, that's my little two cents on, on this very vast question. Thank you, Jennifer. And I, I really agree with what you're saying about it having to be both a top down and bottom up approach at the same time, whereas stakeholders at different levels are, are engaged in the discussion. Um, Hella, would you like to answer the question next? Yeah, no, great. Uh, and of course, big question, as Jennifer says. So, you know, I'm thinking about change every time you want to make a change you have to think about that there are early adapters there are skeptics and there are critics and uh, you oftentimes need a little bit of both i mean you don't want too many critics because then nothing will actually happen and you don't want too many early adapters because then you realize oh my god what did we end up doing so you want a mix and you know you want some skeptics as well and i think that would apply at all levels so one issue maybe to think about is also that at when you are one part of the student body and now unfortunately we don't have mf here uh, but i mean so how your movement relates to the student influence and representatives uh, in general i think is a very important issue as well uh, because you are a part all of uh, we are all a part of ki uh, in in this sense so think about the early adapter skeptic critics uh, among students among teachers we have um, a university where we actually have a lot of established structures that you can use uh, from the course evaluations to the program discussions to, um, you know, departmental discussions uh, to now uh, the leadership discussions as well. So, so use those, uh, you know, use those structures to, uh, you know, ask the questions. Don't wait and ask the questions afterwards to each other, you know, lift them in the uh, in the channels that already exist because they are there um, so that would maybe be uh, one of uh, yeah that would be my main uh, comment for now at least thanks thank you Hella. Ola yes this is a very strong message from me to you uh, because uh, this is one of the most important questions that you can possibly pose how to implement changes which are certainly needed in the global society at large. Behind Jennifer, you see the cover page of our new strategy, 2030. Thank you, Jennifer, for letting everybody see that uh, the time perspective is 2030. And this is, as you understand, not by coincidence. It's the same time perspective as UN's agenda 2030. In fact, our strategy is a marching order, nothing less. It's a marching order, although very few people conceive it as such, but it is intended to be a marching order. That we, as a world leading university, should do what we can to ensure that all the inequities that we see in the world today, the injustice, are uprooted and eliminated. To me, this is a fantastic thing to have this strategy because it's a direct follow-up of the Lancet Commission that I was heading way back in time in 2014, which uh, Renzo also um, referred to. And it dealt with the political origins of health inequity. 
It was an analysis of health inequity in the world. And uh, I dare say what is needed is a new perspective on education. We know that education traditionally, also at KI, has been very much instructive or informative. We don't need informative education any longer because you can seek whatever information you want on the web. Instructive info, uh, education, yes, well, skills are needed, absolutely, not least in the medical sphere. But the third tier of education is the transformative education. This is exactly what this meeting is all about, transformative education. And what is needed when it comes to transformative education in this field? Well, the skill, going back to the skill, is to do two very important things. One thing, and that is exactly what we did in the Lancet Commission, you have to do a power analysis. If you're going to transform something, you need to know where is the power and how should you shift the power. A power analysis is absolutely essential. Also, when it comes to what we're talking about here, decolonizing global health. You have to know where is the conservative power? Where is the power that is the one that you can latch onto if you want to make change? This is a part of transformative education. But then comes the most difficult thing. And we are still not there, I think, in our education. And that is, and it's very simple, to make a change at the level we're discussing here, a global change, a global transformation for health. We need to identify our partners. We need to come up with new and surprising alliances. And that, again, has everything to do with a power analysis. We can't do any, implement any change as one channel, as one academic organization. It's impossible. It has never happened. We have to engage in alliances with industry when that is needed, or with the political authorities when that is needed, with NGOs when that is needed. That's the recipe. And it's a tough recipe for global transformation. And I think that should be embedded, in fact, in our education. How to initiate, how to embark on new alliances in order to promote change. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of your answers. And what I could hear very clearly from what you were saying, Ola, is uh, that there is this power imbalance, maybe. And uh, with power also comes great responsibility. And KI as a leading institution holds a lot of this power. So there is also great room for KI to, uh, to make changes in this uh, sphere and, uh, and make us move forward. And that is also maybe part of KI's responsibility. Uh, Ahmad, would you like to take the next question? Yes. Um, so it's also a question we will ask to all of the panelists. Well, but I will start with Hella, then go to Jennifer, then Ole. Um, so here is the background. Um, if a committee is to be created to research and review KI history and past colonization, of, uh, decolonization effort at KI, um, it needs to review three levels of KI operations. So the curricula and research projects at both GPH department and other KI departments, and also the holistic level of KI as a high, um, um, higher education um, institute. In your current role, how can you contribute to the success of this review, including keeping, uh, keeping it to the uh, stipulated deadlines? So, um, hello, we're starting with you. So you're, you, you want me to establish a committee to, to review all of the things that are listed in the policy or, no, I'm sorry, I'm always asking. No, I, let me, okay, right. so I can explain that. Um, so what happened is, um, uh, so if we are talking about really implementing this policy document, mm -hmm. we need numbers. We need to know where KI stands, what has happened in the past, what is currently happening in the present, 
what improvement has happened, but we don't want to say we've done the improvements. We need to see exactly in numbers how many, for example, projects were implemented in low middle income countries, how many authors used to be during the years being co-authors with KI, what is the position, and then how it progressed over the years. And that's an example of so many conducts uh, that KI does. So to reach that, to have that knowledge, you can, we can do it individually or independently. We need to, ha to have a K KI to create a committee to have that, that conduct and needs to operate or at least include several levels of um, a key um, uh, representatives in that committee. So in your current role, how do you think you can contribute to the success of this review and keeping it to the uh, stipulated deadlines? Yes, so um, I, I'm sorry that I, I'm maybe a bit slow, Ahmad, but you know, I think it's the reason why I hesitate to answer it is that I find that there are so many different pillars in the policy. And when you mention the history of KI and you know what we could do, I mean, there are so many issues to consider which would influence my answer. But if I think about, for example, you mentioned the curriculum. So that's something where my job as a departmental director, it is to make sure that we uh, achieve quality in education and that we monitor that uh, over time. And we make sure that all the, the partners that are engaged in quality of education, that they are kind of following suit in terms of laws and regulations and also now uh, different wishes. So in that respect, in my current role, I could certainly support a process of revisiting uh, curricular issues with this uh, lens that are proposed in the policy document. I think, you know, for example, the curriculum mapping, that is a part of our quality improvement work as it is. It's just a matter of, you know, what kind of issue do we lift? Uh, so, um, you know, for many years, it's been maybe gender that has been on the radar. Now the decolonization uh, lens is moving forward. So that I think I could uh, certainly help with uh, from, from my position and I could help maybe create, um, I mean, if, if we think that today I'm mostly listening in to finding out, so where, where is this move, what is this movement about and where are you seeking to go? then the next step for me would to be to create dialogues, you know, opportunities for dialogues. I think that would be important in order to be able to identify now where are we actually gonna act uh, in a third step. So that would be, um, so, so creating space for dialogue. I see that across all the actors uh, that we have at our department and you know, all uh, most uh, people, well, all people at the department, they are both uh, in teaching and they are doing research. So that would imply that I'm also in collaborative research projects across the world. And some of them would vary reciprocity uh, as the uh, ambition and also as the practice actually. So, so that's, uh, even though I speak as departmental director, I'm also a researcher. Um, yeah, so that would be my first take on this. Yeah, thank you so much, Ella. And indeed, um, curricula has so much power in shaping how the graduates of KI will act and react to um, global public health. And uh, from the literature, there was a um, study that reviewed uh, global health education. And KI is actually one of 41 universities across the world that provides global health masters. Mm -hmm. So indeed, you are shaping how the graduates across the world will act and react. and and. Um, you have such a strong power in pushing forward the decolonization agenda, and we really thank you for the input you just shared. Um, we also would like to ask Jennifer uh, if you'd like to uh, answer the question. Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, in my in my own role, um, I, I already work with and engage with issues in um, decolonizing the curriculum. So um, where do I start? I'm involved in quite a lot of projects to do with education. So one of the largest projects that has just, uh, um, my team and I have, have just gotten the leadership of is to integrate 
um, the different areas of educational competence that are listed in KI strategy to integrate that into the content of the curriculum to all programs at Karolinska. So we are devising tools for program directors and leadership to work with the curriculum, but we also create training material for teachers. Um, we have one course called Teaching in the Global University, and one module is dedicated to global health, global engagement, and thinking, and the nature of knowledge, for example, is one of the things we talk about. Um, I work a lot in intercultural competence development, so um, that is also, for me, a, a, you know, a, a way that I could, I could, uh, uh, we always are, get the teachers to question, you know, how they behave, um, what they value as knowledgeable, where do they get their sources, who is, you know, who is given space in the classroom, who is not. These are conversations that we have all the time in, in, in my, in my um, team's courses in any case, and not just for teachers, we also um, support um, uh, with, we work with support staff, so this is very new. I have a, a colleague who's uh, also integrating these these elements into uh, reflections for for the support staff who who take the course. How I would like to move forward is to have um, uh, a kind of reference group of students to deal with curricular issues, so that we could regularly meet and uh, engage and, uh, you know, people from your group, but maybe other uh, student uh, groups might like, we could create a reference group. And my own like next step for next year is to create a toolkit for teachers on how to think about, well, what do they need to think about if they're interested in this issue of decolonizing um, their, their curriculum. So very, very practical things, but that I would, and, and of course, in consultation with students or a reference group. I, I already talk quite a lot with your group of, of students. We've uh, interacted a, a quite a lot over the last uh, three months uh, and there uh, we've asked them to revise some of the contents of some intercultural competence uh, modules. Uh, so yeah, that's very concrete stuff. But <laughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. And indeed, um, we really are thankful because you you always try to include the voice of the students in the activities you do. And um, it's similar to what has happened now in South Africa in, in their process of decolonization of the curricula is that sometimes even if you are dealing with, for example, by statistics, um, it's quite hard to imagine for the teachers, how am I gonna decolonize that part? And here we can learn from the examples of other universities who succeeded in that. For example, the uh, case you're presenting, the data, uh, where does it come from? How does it, um, um, what does it address uh, when you try to do the practice? So there are so many ways. And sometimes it's more obvious, for example, when we talk about medicine, um, having the patient, what skin color or the ethnicity of the patient you're presenting, and how does the disease show on the skin? There's so many ways that we indeed we can include and um, give the teachers the opportunity to think critically. How, how am I gonna decolonize the curriculum? So thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, we're moving to Ole, if you'd like to answer the question. Yes, uh, I think I can add a few dimensions to, to your question. First of all, I would say that uh, the first thing I experienced at KI was uh, the um, admirable understanding on the part of the teachers that it's very, very important to look into all these issues in the classroom. And I remember the very first month I was here, I attended uh, some lectures in global health, in fact. And uh, I was impressed by the dialogue in the classroom. So I think our teachers, they are sterling examples, I think, of teachers who can really bring uh, these issues forward. So uh, I would rather like to say that uh, we have so much to build on. Uh, not least because of the skills and insight of our teachers. So your question was very specific, a committee that looks into the history of KI. That was one of your questions. And in fact, I've taken the initiative to do exactly this. So there is a working group, a, we don't call it a committee, but a working group that looks into our past and not least into the stories and uh, I would say tragedies 
of the Retzius family because there was father, father and son who was uh, who were involved in this. Of course, we we have a past that is uh, checkered uh, with some spots that uh, would not stand up to the ethical requirements that we have today. Absolutely, and we should not shy away from looking into this history. We should we should learn from it, but we should not bury it. We should not destroy the statue of Retzius because if we do that. In one generation, we won't be able to go back again to our the black spots in our history. We have to keep our history, but to contextualize it in a better way than it's done today. And I'm happy that our students are involved in this uh, very important work. It's about understanding our history, learning from it, and to look at our history in the present day context. But you know, again, it's very, very important to look at what is going on. We have in real life a project that is overseeing all the aspects of global health that we are decrying today, including the aspect that has to do with our colonial past. And that is again the project with the Makarere University. From the very beginning, this was meant to be a project that not only should bring us a new understanding in medicine and health, but that should provide a platform for a new modus operandi when it comes to international collaboration. And then again, I have a sort of warning here because you say, let's count the number of studies with international authors. Let's uh, look at, uh, I think you had another example also as to what can be counted. But you should be reminded of what uh, Einstein said. Not everything that can be counted counts. And not uh, everything that counts can be uh, counted. And I think the most important trap that you can possibly fall into is that you end up in believing that we can come up with figures that show us how successful we are or how unsuccessful we are when it comes to uh, global health issues. Because there are a lot of soft uh, endeavors here, soft processes that cannot be counted. Just two examples, or three examples. Two of them were mentioned previously, that uh, we have to look at uh, reverse innovation and reciprocal learning to have respect for the innovation and the learning processes also among our collaborative partners. That's one thing. It's very difficult to count this. The second issue, which also cannot be counted, is the time perspective. The reason why global health is attainted, one of the reasons is why global health is a tainted uh, sort of um, a term is that many of the projects carried out also by Karolinska Institute, for, in, for instance, Africa, they have had a very short time perspective. You go to Africa, you do a project, and you go back again, not caring about the very fundamental issue that the project you're carrying out should come to the benefit of the African people. The results must be implemented in new policies. This is the time dimension that we would like to build into the Makarere project. Our scientists should not dash to Makerere and then go back again, because that leaves no trace for a better health. It's a time perspective. And the third thing that cannot be easily counted is the community engagement in the parts of the world that we are working. So I would issue a very strong warning signal. Don't ever believe that all these issues can be reduced to figures and numbers. It's impossible. This has to be dealt with in the classroom in the concrete projects. Again, latch onto what is going on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ole. And indeed, um, it's not just the, the numbers, because you're right. Uh, you can't reduce things to just being numbers. But sometimes the numbers can give you an indication. It can be a tool. So it's not the end goal. It's just a tool that you, you can use uh, along the way. Uh, but um, one thing because uh, you said about the statue and um, in our introduction, we reflected on uh, what happened with uh, Cecil uh, Rhodes and 
it was removed from University of Cape Town. And although now the statue has been removed, they reshaped the history of it. And they now mentioned that its removal was a delivery for justice. And it's not, um, the statue itself is not the history. It's how, what you do with the statue is the history. And I think this is what you also were trying to say with this uh, work group is trying to do. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And uh, now I'd like to give the floor to Emma to ask the question. Thank you very much, Ahmed. My next question actually also relates to what you all have brought up about the Retius working group. So we know that this working group has been working uh, on the renaming issue for the past six years, but we see very few tangible outcomes. So my question to you is how do we prevent that the decolonization committee and this policy paper along with that uh, and other DGH processes at KEI don't encounter that same pitfall? It's not true what you're saying. You must uh, follow up the process. The statue has been moved already and it's going to be put into a museal context. This is exactly what uh, I mean by the term recontextualize. It's not even true what you're saying about the names. It's true that we still haven't renamed the, uh, the, uh, the lecture, lecture halls and so forth. But if you go to the lecture hall, the refuse, you will see that now the refuse name has been put into a new context. There is a text placed underneath his name, which points to what he has done, uh, not only his successes uh, in his own research, but also what cannot be counted as a success. So it's not true what you're saying. You must follow up the process. And uh, of course, there is still much to be done. And we hope that this process will continue also with the voices of the students. But again, I hope that you agree, we cannot demolish the statue of Retsus. I'm totally against it because this leaves no room for the next generation to go back and revisit history. You have a privilege by having the statue of Retsus here. It's a privilege to have a sort of platform or a starting point for revisiting our history. We cannot, we cannot steal this privilege from future generations. Uh, thank you very much for that. And if we would put this in the context of decolonization, how do you see that this should be uh, taken forward? Well, I, I think that the, the Retsius name, uh, father and son, is an excellent starting point for discussing exactly the, uh, the colonial legacy in our um, research and education. It's a classical example of uh, what transpired in a different era but, uh, and with a different ethical context. But nevertheless, it's a lesson learned as to how we should not proceed today. Of course, again, it's a matter not only of power asymmetry, but a matter of uh, the very essential view of what is a human being. I think that we can use the Retsu story, in fact, creatively in our own education and teaching. The worst thing we can do is to shy away from history. We should learn from it. And the Retsius era is a tragic case of, of it, exactly what we're discussing here, how Karolinska Institute and of Sweden looked at, I mean, even Finland as a sort of a second rate country where we could do exactly what we wanted to do. This is a fantastic, don't misunderstand me, a fantastic example as to how we could put our history also into an educational context on this very day. Could I, I would like to add, I mean, going back to some of the discussions earlier about seeing this as a process. So you can also start looking, for example, at Widerström Skarhuset, where we have GPH. 
we have a, quite a diversity in the kind of names uh, that are used. For example, you might remember that we have Amatuja uh, Lecture Hall. We also have Wangari Lecture Hall from uh, the first woman who get the Nobel Peace Prize. So you see that there is a process of things uh, where you can get a multitude of voices also in the naming of rooms. Uh, just as a, as a reminder of the need of time that we have talked about multiple times. Thank you, and absolutely we agree that things are, uh, are a process, but sometimes there is not maybe, there is an urgency in the issue as well, and sometimes there is a need to expedite processes uh, and move on maybe in a quicker fashion. Um, well, I, I, I beg to disagree. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with uh, what uh, Helle says, that the process is the most important thing. It should not go on forever. But I think the whole process, process is a learning experience. I think it's a good thing that it goes over years, because the longer it lasts, the more students will be engaged in this very important uh, process. So it's, I mean, I, I, I disagree. It's, I think we are doing a grand mistake if we rush at, uh, um, uh, let's say, solutions without really having a very deep discussion as to what we are doing. Go back to, for instance, a classical discussion um, that they had at the uh, British Museum just recently with Stephen Fry. It's on YouTube. You can listen to this discussion and it gives you all the perspectives that we have to bring into our own discussion about um, about uh, reds use. Uh, the Stephen Fry discussion has to do with the marbles at the uh, British Museum, whether they should be transferred back to, to Greece or not. Fantastic, because you know, there are so many perspectives to such discussions that cannot be rushed. It's a fascinating discussion that has to go on for years. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ole, and indeed, but um, I, I understand that process takes time, but um, it's just a, a reflection because um, I come from Jordan and my country was colonized by the British before. And um, just a quick reflection, if you take it from perspective of someone who come from a low and middle income country that has been colonized before, now it has been more than 100 years of being colonized by the British. And things are not going as, as smooth as people think. And that's, and I understand process takes time. I've worked before at, at the UN before coming here. And uh, I've, I've learned firsthand how things take time, indeed, especially in policy. Mm -hmm. But we also need to remember these movements that they call for. And if we are, set to keep using the same tools we've been using over time, we are doomed to repeat exactly what has been happening over the years. And then we will come to the point that the people who have been affected will still remain affected by that. And what hurts them from that legacy will still be hurt by that legacy till now, until we move to that level, which I understand it will take its time to, to, for it to happen. But until then, those people will still need to live with that legacy, with that hurt throughout their life. So that is something we, we can reflect on together um, throughout the process. Um, I would like now to ask a question to Helle and Jennifer, uh, because you both work with students. And as an institution, KI is bound by laws, regulations, and demands by internal and external factors. How do you think that student-led movements and pressure can help in supporting KI's ambitions and uh, in DGH? Uh, do you want me to start, uh, Jennifer? So I think what you're doing exactly now is one example. So I know there is some overlap between those engaged in this movement and those who are engaged as student representatives, but I guess they're not completely overlapping. 
So, um, so I, I think this this forum shows that there is room to build, you know, uh, subgroups uh, around uh, the institutional channels that you have, and maybe this is also a way that you can actually find each other and have discussions around it, how to find your voice as students, you know, how to link between international students and students who are more in profession programs um, uh, that have different kind of topics uh, at hand. Then, of course, from a um, institutional perspective or a department perspective, it's always who is representing who. So we are talking about quite complex questions about how we are to represent history and how history will judge us. So, of course, we also have to think about who are we representing in smaller or bigger movements. And of course, as the departmental director, I would have to be very conscientious about that, that those that speak the loudest are not necessarily those, uh, the only ones that should, you know, have power. So, so I do think these horizontal structures we need to find a form for that that we don't really have because of I mean we don't we just haven't had so much exposure to it so we would have to have some dialogue meetings on how now the official uh, representatives and class representatives will liaise with different types of movements uh, this one being maybe only one so I would I would like to think that we could uh, discuss that and we have at each institution educators where we have subgroups uh, that can discuss internationalization that can discuss issues within the programs outside of the program so there are ample opportunities uh, to uh, you know elaborate on that on that structure thanks thank you so much Hella. and um the thing is i was one of the student reps and indeed i remember how the student voice was listened to and it was very much encouraged in, in um, and I really look forward for the next uh, now first year students who will be part of the, um, for example, JPH UN, that they will carry the voice and they will try to channel it as well. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your uh, input uh, on this question. And um, Jennifer. Um, would yes, like to I don't know if I have you. very much to add to what Hella said, because yeah, it's, I think it's a matter of docking into existing it's very complicated because universities, especially old universities, are very vertical structures and they're very much used to working within silos. Um, and so it's about like these kind of transversal things. How do we, how can we reimagine ways of working so that, you know, we, we can, we can ha have this. So it's like, um, it's, yeah, there, there are tensions. Uh, but it's not impossible. I think you have to be creative. Uh, and I think you have to speak to as many people in different roles so that you get a, an overview of, of, of the institution. My unit plays that privileged role. So this is where I would see this is a natural place for us to start talking, right? And, 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 and partnering in, in this together is, is to, to, to find a home for you in my unit Right, and where we can we can build from there too, but I don't have anything else much to add uh, to what Hella said. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for your input. And um, Emma. Yes, so I have one very last question, and that one, uh, anyone who would like to to answer is open to do so. Uh, I would like to uh, restate what the Editor-in-Chief of BMJ Global Health, uh, Seyan Bimbala, and uh, influential scholar and epidemiologist Maduka Pai has said, and that is that empathy and heartfelt desire to make the world a better place is not enough to bring about real change. And they continue to, to assert that the only vaccines against supremacy are respect and humility. So, how do we avoid false humility and respect, uh, fake wokeness and tokenism, but at the same time uh, create a real space uh, for uh, systemic decolonizing, decolonizing changes at KI? Uh, who would like to? Maybe Ola? Yes, uh, I, it's an uh, interesting 
question. And again, it speaks to what we have been discussing throughout this meeting that uh, we, have, we have to couple whatever ambition we have to something concrete. That's uh, the way to go. And uh, just one example, which I think is extremely important example, and that hasn't been lifted during this meeting, and that is a surprise, in fact. And that is the uh, injustice when it comes to vaccine distribution globally. I've been writing about this. And in fact, mind you, when I raise this issue, I won't name names, but, but when I raise this issue on a top political level here in Sweden, I was met with not only resistance, but with something that amounts to um, a condescending denial of the problem. Mind you, that's the way to go. Not to have these very, very overarching discussions, but really to couple what they're talking about to what is going on in the world today. And I think this is, again, what I think is missing uh, in this discussion. A much closer coupling to reality, to what we are facing as challenges as we speak. And today, this very day, what I see as a test of global solidarity and justice is how we distribute vaccines worldwide. You know, I'm on the, on the board of what is called the African Population and Health Research Center in Nairobi. And the last discussion we had had to do with the distribution of vaccines in Africa. If nothing changes, it might well be that some of the countries in, in Africa will not have access to vaccines fully before 2024. This is what we are talking about. This is the colonial vestige of global health. This is where we should put much of our energy. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. I think uh, that was all of the questions that uh, we had for you. If we maybe have a question from the audience. Um, yeah, so we have um, a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, we will say, uh, first go with, so is there a space in Karolinska's approach for learning from Global South and low and middle income countries? So who would like to answer this question? I can repeat it again if you want. Um, is there a space in Karolinska's approach for learning from the global south and low and middle income countries? So maybe I could just say a few words really quick. I mean, I think we have mentioned some of them that within research, we have these longer term collaborative uh, projects or consortiums where there are representation from around the world, including low income setting and high burden settings and then higher income countries. So, I mean, in research projects, if you look at the more specific ones within research groups and research projects, there are ample opportunities uh, and a lot of space at different levels. Uh, some of our current master students, uh, I believe, are writing master theses within collaborations between countries uh, from different continents. So that's uh, that, that is one type of space. Then in education, more specifically, we have exchange programs. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we have talked about the McCarrier exchange uh, that has been going on. And otherwise, uh, I think maybe that is, uh, there are not so many established co collaborations at this point with universities uh, in, uh, in the southern part of the world towards the northern. So, so that's maybe one issue that is, is not really where there is a gap. Um, yes, these were a couple of examples. Thank you so much, uh, Helle. Um, we also um, got this question about how can uh, students directly get involved at the different levels 
um, so they can voice out the decolonizing global health uh, agenda. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat? So we got this question about how can students uh, at KI get directly involved in the process um, to deliver the voice of decolonizing global health agenda? Well, I would say, but you want to say something, Helle? I just want to say, um, you know, um, work with the, the student unions, go and see MF. I, will, I, I mean, you know, these kinds of platforms exist um, at all levels of the university. We have student representation. Go and sit in commissions. It's not, it's not all boring. You participate in making your institution a, a better place. Uh, and I think, you know, um, get involved in the existing uh, um, places where there, where there are, where there are, there is student representation. I think that would be really key. We, we often struggle with getting enough students to, to, to join the commissions and, and to find enough people. So, yeah, I would say those are key places to go. So I would like to add that I think it starts with it starts with our, ourselves. So it starts with each student who meets a teacher in a, in a lecture where something is is happening and you have questions and you think something is missing. Maybe you have a comment that there is no critical literature or you have a comment that there is only shown one side of a debate. So I, I think that's really where it starts between in every interaction. Uh, you had some of the reviewers mentioning initially that the interpersonal characteristics and the interpersonal collaborations are very important. Uh, uh, and that's where I think it's, it can start. Uh, so you have the student uh, evaluations uh, as the first step also uh, where you can anonymously point to gaps that you found in each of the courses that you take uh, and then moving forward up, uh, up the system that I have talked about earlier. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, that's a wrap up for our uh, panel discussion. We really would like to thank our panelists for today, uh, Ola Peter, uh, Helle and Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for giving the time and also uh, reflecting on how the current conduct is, is, is going at KI and having a futuristic look how we can improve, how we can work together um, and also carry the, the voice of the students and integrate it in our, uh, our work. So um, thank you so much uh, for today. And thank you for all the good work. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I echo that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very so that will be all for today. So thanks to everyone who joined. Uh, special thanks again to our panelists and our external reviewers. Uh, this event was recorded and will be made available on YouTube in the next few days. And uh, we will send a uh, reading list as well with some of the articles uh, that were shared by Ola Peter Odison. But um, for now, that's it. We look forward to continuing this conversation in the future. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.